Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first session in our series of discussions on India's new data protection law. Um, before we start, I'll take a moment to quickly introduce myself and the firm. Um, we're a law firm with a sharp focus on technology and innovation. We've been advising businesses on data protection right from the Justice Sri Krishna Committee, which was set up to, to recommend a data protection law for India. And we've also seen and tracked, led conversations across multiple iterations of the, of the law. Um, my name is Srinidhi Srinivasan. I have my partner Neha Chaudhary joining me from Bangalore. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, as you all know, the new data law is here after being in the works for nearly six years. Um, the law really calls for a rethink on how any platform, any organization, any business uh, thinks about or, or collects, uses, shares, stores, does any activity related to personal data. Um, and to help different kinds of businesses understand the law, understand its impact on their models, on their products, we're doing a series of webinars focusing on just the business impact. How does this affect you? What you should be doing? What are immediate steps for compliance? Uh, today's session is focused on the basics, implementation, what are some practical challenges that you might encounter? Uh, what are key concepts, key concerns under the law? Uh, the next few sessions um, will be, the next one will be specifically on the role of a fiduciary and a processor, really who you are in this, in this chain. Uh, we'll have a session on just what platform user interfaces might look like, what notice would look like, what would be consent forms, what kind of legitimate users can you use and share data, can you use data for, what, what changes externally. Um, we'll be having a session on just companies' obligations, do's and don'ts, uh, a deep dive into some of the more critical aspects of compliance, some of the more critical uh, questions and, and requirements that the, that the law places on you. And we'll conclude this five-part series with, with, with a session on just the sectoral interplay. Um, you know, AI, health tech, different kinds of fintech, different kinds of businesses, what the law means for, for, for each of these. Um, thank you also for, to, to a lot of you who sent us questions um, on, on, on the chat earlier uh, and in the registration form and we'll try and weave these in uh, in our conversation today and across these five sessions that we're doing. Um, so maybe digging right in into, into today's theme, uh, we'll, we'll start with maybe an overview or, or initial thoughts on the law. What are sort of the first steps towards compliance? Who are the right people to get on board? What to do immediately? Um, we'll talk about how this law, you know, affects business strategy overall and governance, um, operationalizing the law, what are sort of when to expect rules to come in, um, do we, do we, we, we still have rules to, rules to wait for, but does that mean we do nothing at this point? What can we do in the interim, uh, actionable steps for, for compliance? And we'll also briefly touch upon how this law stacks up against global laws. Um, I'd request everyone to maybe also add questions to the chat and we'll, uh, we'll pick them up along the way while we're, uh, while we're discussing various themes, uh, under this or, or towards the end as well. Um, so before maybe we start, actually, I'm going to start with a question for Neha, um, and, and, and just on her initial impressions of the law, initial thoughts, um, on the law. Thanks SS. Uh, uh... Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for so much for joining us uh, for the first of this uh, webinar series as we deep dive into our data protection law. I'm just personally very, very excited that we finally have a law, Srinidhi. Uh, for many of us who've been working on this uh, from the beginning, I think it's been about five or six years, six years, I think now, uh, that we've been working on uh, personal data protection law, beginning with the TRI consultation, uh, moving on to Sri Krishna, and then uh, the entire process that took place in Parliament. So I'm very excited. I think it's a great first step, honestly. I think there's a lot of devil that we'll see come through the details um, like you yourself were talking about because a lot has been left to, um, uh, the, a lot about the implementation has been left to the rules. But I think that we've got um, a great first principles-based legislation uh, I think that it's broadly in line with what we see taking place uh, around the world in terms of how data protection legislations are shaping up. I do think that there are one or two um, or three areas of key differences. But I think on the whole, um, fair amount of alignment, I would say, with uh, global data protection norms. 
um yeah same question for you shrinidhi what do you think uh yeah i agree i agree i think uh, for for a lot of us who've been in this space for a while been tracking this this conversation it's uh, it's cathartic to see the law actually finally being uh, passed and now excited for the next step because there is this is just the beginning of the journey there is a lot that needs to be done um in 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 really evaluating the impact for different kinds of products different kinds of business models um looking at you know revisiting any interaction that a business has with individuals um your platform user interface what you're telling users on a platform what 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 data you're collecting from them what you use it for your relationship with your vendors who you might be entrusting data with other partners that you're working with um so uh, while we've had a long journey on the principles and concepts now it's really actionable what do we need to do what needs to change should we have a checkbox in our uh you know platform journey in the customer journey on the platform um should we have a hovering notice here what is what is sort of what, what is the real world sort of impact does this mean our agreements with vendors need to change do we add certain clauses for data protection specifically for for vendors uh, what is really our role are we a fiduciary processor and and what are the implications of 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 that so excited to see how this will this will play out uh, what real world sort of changes on ground especially in a country like ours and and for the plethora of models uh, business models products that are that are out there across the country i just i just want to pick up on that last thing that you said shinidhi and maybe given um, you know given the theme of today's webinar where I, i just want to take a step back and really start thinking through some of the first uh, literally step 1 step 2 step 3 um as a business right where do we begin because i can also imagine that um it can be a little bit overwhelming this is a little bit of a paradigm shifting legislation at least in so far as india is concerned for the moment um all of the data protection laws that we've had have focused on protecting sensitive personal data now this is a big sort of shift that we're seeing with the coming in of this new law where we are moving in towards a regime where we are looking at protecting all kinds of personal data um and so far we've had most of our um you know added sort of compliances come through different kinds of sectoral regulations but this is re again really the first time that we're having this overarching sort of privacy statute right which then tends to i mean there's so much so um maybe if we could talk about some of these big picture themes first right because a legislation like this like you were mentioning also um will pretty much cut across everything that a business has to think about starting from strategic decisions to how i have to now think about product development i have to anticipate um you know potential compliance compliance hiccups um and perhaps even rethink sort of governance as a whole right so um could you start us off by you know throwing some light on how is a business i should start thinking about some of these things who are the different people that i should sort of you know begin to get on board how do i start to have some of these conversations um sort of internally that's that's my first sort of question and my second question uh which is again something that we've seen come through um our registration forms um and thank you so much uh to the folks that did send in these questions is um even perhaps even a little bit zoomed out right it's more on the lines of um uh is there a competitive advantage that i get as a business from sort of getting ahead from getting ahead of the curve uh from a privacy regulation um and data protection governance point of view uh what are we what are what are we seeing and hearing um you know from the industry do people see this as a competitive advantage or in a manner of speaking has that now gone away because well the law is there and everyone at some point or the other has to comply with the law in any case sure sure yeah no i'll start with the first question what is really the first thing that you should be doing given the scale of this this exercise given sort of the touch points with different kinds of teams um and i think before we even sort of start reading the law do do any of that it's it's deep diving into any concept of the law it's really to get the relevant folks on board get the senior leadership on board get get your business leads product leads on board on the same page um particularly this is a subject where where none of the teams can really operate in isolation and 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 go the long haul right um it necessarily requires sort of close involvement with product business other teams 
Um, each of these teams touch data, but in different ways. Um, HR teams, for example, have details about employees, rejected candidates that whose data you may still have on file. Marketing sales team might be running interest-based ads to even just for consumer goods, you may be sending samples to, to, to different households. If you're an FMCG company, your vendor procurement team has, has contact details of, of vendors who might be individuals. Product team, of course, has, has reasons for, say, asking for certain kinds of phone permissions, asking for retain, retaining IP addresses, retaining a whole bunch of, you know, device identifiers, number of apps installed, all of these, there's, there's some reason behind, behind each of these activities or each of these permissions or or any touch point that you have with data and 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 the law does require you to sort of evaluate each of these or assess each of these um, it requires time effort involvement so the first thing really is to get people involved get them to have this conversation start with maybe a session um, where where you're talking about the law where you're uh, distilling what what sort of impact this might have uh, on these different journeys wherever a different wherever an individual team has any kind of interface or touch point with, with 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 any individual, whether it's a consumer facing platform or it's your own employees, um, or even vendors who are who are individuals because you're collecting their personal data. Um, so really, sort of identifying that and in some way acknowledging and accepting that this is a shift from from how things are done. Um, we, I mean, for a bunch of conversations that we've also been having over the past few weeks, it's it is a rethink of sorts. It is that 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 you know that there may be some practices which we've gotten so used to, but but those aren't really in conformity with with privacy principles around the world, and the and the law wants to clamp down on. Um, Willy nilly sort of data sharing and data collection, which is not linked to a particular purpose. So really sort of, you know, bringing that kind of mindset change, um, it, it, it will have some lead time, it will take some time and, and, and effort as well to get there, but really getting people in the same room and, and, and sort of impressing upon them what the law means, distilling it down to actionables, what is really, in fact, the first question often is really what is even personal data? Uh, is it, is it just, and I think we, we'll come to that as well in, in the course of today's conversation, but what is the scope of the law? Is corporate data part of this? Helping the product business teams also demystify some of these uh, some of these concepts. Um, and and yeah, also this this acknowledgement that it is a it is a journey. It's not going to happen sort of overnight. So identifying what is critical to do right now um, versus what you might want to stagger, what you might want to wait for the rules to come through as well. Uh, identifying that kind of priority. Um, and 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 really, once this sort of base is set, then it's about mapping your data, um, knowing your data completely, having complete visibility over whether it's flowing through emails, whether it's flowing through some third party uh, application, where even if you're storing someone's personal data, like an email or list on SharePoint, like we do, and a bunch of other, you know, any any sort of wherever you're, you have and 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 you've collected, you stored individuals' data in some 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 shape or form within the organization, mapping that out. Who, how did it come into your systems till the time it sort of is deleted or, or purged or erased from your systems? Mapping out that 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 journey, and this can definitely take a while. It can take a few months as well to dig deeper, probe deeper, and 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 understand. And I think one thing to also think. About about when whenever uh, it definitely sounds like an it sounds like an arduous sort of task often um, you know it's a, it's a massive piece of legislation there's sort of so much to do here but at the end of the day the data law is also it's it's kind of often not setting out hard do's and don'ts it's uh, it's not setting out those bright lines except in certain circumstances where it makes the decision for the for the business uh, but more but but largely it's um can you guys hear me because i see a few comments that yeah yeah i can hear you very clearly okay um yeah so um just i think so so on the law just um yeah on on hard do's and don'ts so so the law typically data protection laws avoid doing that um it's 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 more principle based um, and there is room for interpretation because it is very context specific as well. 
Um, for example, say the consent clause might say that consent has to be necessary for a for the specified purpose for for the for processing. Uh, what is necessary will look very different for different kinds of businesses. Um, so that's why sort of I, I think that acknowledgement as well that 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 it's not as though the law is telling you don't use data, don't provide business. It's only saying do it in a in 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 a more privacy conscious manner. Um, yeah. And I think you you also had a question on the right people. Um, so one is of course the the different teams that we work with, but typically there would be somebody who's leading the privacy function in in an organization. The law also requires significant data fiduciaries to appoint data protection officers uh, who can liaise, who can be the spokes for the data really, uh, spokes for for privacy for the privacy role um, really, and. Uh, Often, I think usual suspects are the lawyers, compliance folks, legal compliance teams, but we've also seen sometimes CISOs playing that role um, or, or even CTOs because the thinking is they have certain like, you know, visibility over, over data that the legal folks also might not have. Uh, so it really depends on size, nature of the organization. But yeah, often I see someone in the legal team uh, being, being, being appointed a DPO. I'll Got pause. It. Got it. So if I could just, um, if I could crystallize this into some kind of action items, right? One of course is, um, get ready for, uh, get ready for a little bit of a long haul, and be okay. I think with the with the fact that there might be some discomfort here, and um, be ready. I would say for like we were talking about earlier, right? A paradigm shift. There might be wholesale changes that we need to make, um, in terms of how we're, uh, you know, in terms of how we're offering products or services in the country because. Um, so much uh, uh, of our data protection practices, et cetera, will need to change. Um, and uh, the other thing that you spoke about, of course, is just sort of start getting ready for compliance. So, you know, begin with having some of these conversations internally, engaging with the law a little bit more deeply, making a list of priority areas. Um, I thought that was a very valuable suggestion um, that not everything needs to be complied with all at once. There will be critical parts of the bill. And again, this might look of the, of the law now, sorry, uh, that will look different for different businesses as well, right? What is... Um, uh, what is critical for me to comply with today uh, may not necessarily be the same thing um, uh, Same thing for you, depending on the different kinds of hats that we're wearing. So to make a list of these priority areas and to gear up for this kind of phased compliance, I think is a second um, sort of action item. And the third thing that, uh, again, that you spoke about is then, you know, start figuring out um, this data map. What are the different uh, data points that we're collecting and sort of figuring out how data is flowing within our organization and any other third parties or group entities with whom we might be sharing this data. Now, we've had a couple of very um, uh, questions also come in on timelines and on rules. Um, Shinidhi, any insights that we have uh, uh, because the rule is silent, uh, because the law itself is silent on timelines. We've had the minister make some statements um, in the recent past that could shed that could shed some light. Uh, previous versions of the bill, interestingly enough, did have some kind of phased um, phased uh, uh, you know implementation suggested, but uh, in this law, uh, conspicuous a little bit by its absence. And uh, the second thing, again, on um, on compliance that I wanted to talk to you about was uh, given that so much of this is being left up to the rules, right? Pretty much every section that you see, uh, there is some kind of language that says as may be prescribed as may be prescribed by the rules. Uh, should we wait for the rules to come through or phrased actually differently? Because my personal view is that companies should start now. Um, but so then what should we do? Uh, while we wait for the rules to come. Sure. Um, yeah, on on timelines, like you said, it, it isn't sort of hard coded in the law, but uh, both ministers have made some remarks which suggest that the timeline they might be thinking of is six to 10 months, some kind of graded implementation as well, where some provisions might kick in before the others. Um, there is, of course, still still a bunch to be done through rules like say form of notice, how would individuals make requests for data, what are verifiable parental consent methods, what are countries to which you can't transfer data, a bunch of different things. The DPB has to be set up, the Data Protection Board for adjudicate, adjudication of penalties. So it could also be graded implementation that, that maybe some chapters kick in um, earlier and, and, and like we saw with the companies that certain sections came in first before the others, potentially that could be one, one, one way of thinking about it as well. Uh, 
um but 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 yeah somewhat of first year six month lead time um but 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 at the same time if the rule making process starts operationalizing in 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 parallel then uh, even once the rules come in there should be some kind of a window there uh, because we'll have some more specifics but there is also a lot of groundwork to be done uh, which was just a second question on 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 should we be waiting and we should not be waiting at at, at this time in fact for 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 a bunch of years now, a lot of us have been um, working with clients on at least. So how I how I view it is maybe bucketed into two categories. One is like what you should know, um, and and the second is what you should do. Like my partner Aprajita also likes to think of these in 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 these two distinct terms. Like the what you should know bit is just what are you um, your own data practices, your different individual activities that you are doing with the data. Uh, just getting that visibility, that data data mapping, um, focusing on, you know, any touch point with the individual, why do you need certain data beyond a generic framing like it's for a, for a specified purpose, but slightly more specific answers. For instance, do, do you need both IP address and phone number to be able to detect frauds? Um, even despite a user making a request, sometimes you may need to retain some of their data uh, for these purposes like fraud protection for network security to prevent maybe an offense. Um, for employment purposes, of course, that's a that's a different um, ground for usage as well. But but kind of drilling down to some granular reasons beyond what often privacy policies have those ten broad users specified using the platform, improving the product. But at least internally having a record on specifically why you might need certain certain data attributes, um, and then knowing your role really. Are you a fiduciary or are you a processor? Uh, just because you're a B2B company doesn't mean that you will always be a data processor. Uh, and we'll dig much deeper into this in, in our next session. Uh, but but just that sort of a, you know, that that sort of a, what is your relationship with the different entities that you're, that, that, that you're working with, uh, partners, affiliates, uh, vendors, all of these. So, so this bit itself, just mapping out the data can often take, um, can take a while, can take a couple of uh, months as well, depending on 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 appetite there, on on sort of you know the um, the uptake with with different teams, um, and 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 often it's it's sort of educating, sensitizing them as well on what really is personal data. Um, so really sort of doing that bit, covering all of all of that ground on knowing your activities, knowing what data you have, or all of that that entire chain, demystifying it for yourself. Uh, and understanding the gaps and the actual what you should be doing, like the rolling out of, say, product level changes, the tooling, whatever needs to change, the documents, external privacy policies, notice. Um, that, of course, it, it it makes better sense to like the form of notice might be prescribed by the government. The actual form of parental verification might be prescribed by the government as well when you're processing children's data. So while creating all of that, all of that, you know, groundwork, all of that homework that you need uh, so that once the rules come out, you're only implementing the change. So, I mean, I'd probably distill them into into these buckets, just having that overall visibility that's sort of critical um, to to do. Got it. So uh, useful to start now, uh, start answering some of these first principle questions that you yourself had, uh, that you had flagged just now, uh, because um, the rules are going to tell us the how of the operationalizing, but I suppose the obligation will be there, right? It's a matter of just sort of implementation, I think, that we're going to get a little bit more clarity from, uh, clarity through the rules, but the obligation is going to be there and there's a, there's a lot of homework that we need to do uh, while we're, uh, you know, while we're waiting for the rules to come through. Um, um, what is the first... Neha, I can't hear you. I don't know if it's just me. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So basically, we, while we're waiting for the rules to give us clarity on how to implement uh, large pieces of the legislation, given that the substantive obligation, uh, you know, of course, is going to be there, there aren't really going to be material changes, uh, uh, you know, that the rules are going to make to the substantive obligation, uh, useful for us to start now with uh, an understanding on some of these first principle questions, including really, um, who are we in collection to the data that we, in relation to the data that we're collecting and using, whether we're a data fiduciary, whether we're a data processor. Uh, before we get into this, I think there are a couple of other more first principle questions as well, Srinidhi, right? One is that the bill um, is the applicability of the bill itself, 
right? One is now, uh, again, that it applies to digital personal data. But very interestingly, we also see language where uh, publicly available data has been excluded. And in our own internal discussions that we've been having on the PDP bill, on this DPDP Act now, uh, this has proven to be something that's uh, that's been uh, really, really interesting um, and in some ways um, uh, made for a lot of interesting conversation, right? So what really is this um, exclusion uh, for publicly available data mm -hmm. and how do we anticipate it might play out in practice? Uh, that's sort of the first question that I have for you. And another question that we've seen come through uh, you know, these, these, the, the registration forms has been on the extraterritorial applicability of, um, of the law. Again, I don't think that we're seeing anything radically different in our law on extraterritoriality that we haven't seen in other legislations, including the GDPR. Uh, but maybe that's something that we'll talk about, um, in a bit as well. But let's, let's start with this question of really what is governed, right? What kinds of data is governed and what kind of data is not governed? For example, uh, what is the scope really of personal data? We've done away with categories. Uh, what happens to anonymous, uh, you know, anonymized data? Let's, let, let's start with really what is the universe of data? said it's digital personal data offline files old old records are not really within the ambit of the law unless they are digitized at some point unless they're put into some computer file uh but if it is something which is i mean if it is entirely sort of uh, actually yeah, any any kind of digital personal data is is covered within the ambit of the law uh personal data means anything that can identify an individual relates to an individual um, so it's your pure play identifiers, obviously, like say name, phone number, uh, Aadhaar, PAN, all of these things that can identify you, government IDs. Uh, it's also profile data, which is linked to you that say um, Neha purchased so-and-so bag on such and such date or, or any kind of transaction history, say loan repayment history. All of that is within the ambit of uh, personal data. What is not covered though is completely anonymized data, which is not linked to a person. Um, so soil trends, weather patterns, data, which was never really um, uh, identifiable, which never really linked to an individual. And also data, which is completely anonymized in, in a way that it's, it really can't link back to the individual. Um, so maybe, you know, in that same example, say Neha bought such and such brand of shoes, so is more likely to buy socks. Or, or you're more likely to say respond to uh, promotional offers between 9 and 11 a.m. On, on, on Saturday. These are all linked to an individual person. These are all linked to Neha. Uh, but if we were to completely anonymize that, it's at an inference, at an aggregate level of persons living in um, Koramangla, whatever this, this phase in this neighborhood, are more likely to do so and so. That's an anonymized reference, which, which doesn't really... Uh, it's not possible in, in, in that situation when it's not possible to kind of reverse engineer and go back to a, a particular individual that's anonymized data. That's kind of, you know, that's, that's inference. That's, that's, that's an inference, which is not linked to an individual. So that's, um, that the law is not, not concerned with really because it's more focused on, on, on just uh, personal data. Let me ask you two related questions and I think you've addressed them because they've come in on the chat, right? What do we do with two disparate data points that together, you know, uh, data point A, data point B, when it comes together, uh, sort of, you know, becomes, that can be used to identify a person. And generally on pseudonymized data and, and anonymized data. Question is in the context of clinical trials, but I mean, maybe we can talk about this more generally as well. Yeah. So if they are two distinct data points, but you, um, I mean, you have the ability to it both reside within your organization and you do have the ability to reverse engineer and identify an individual. They do become personal data um, cumulatively. Um, of course, in India, we don't have any decisions or anything here, but but the definition is sort of global, uh, widely understood, uh, recognized GDPR and in GDPR and other regions as well, that anything that can identify you, can you can reverse engineer, trace back to the individual um, works. I mean, there's nothing really in the law which suggests what the test for that would be uh, at this stage, but perhaps like with other countries, there will be some legal threshold also that we add here. Um, for instance, I'm, I'm reminded of the UK ICO, for instance, has come up with a motivated intruder test. Uh, 
where they say this is from a while ago, but I think it's the same test that they that they continue to use, which is just that your um, if 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 within the organization, actually, if if you are a third party fully and you are with with sufficient tools, uh, you don't have inside access, but you are able to from a data set trace back and identify an individual. Um, you're a motivated intruder. Your 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 intent on reverse engineering, and you're able to do that with publicly available means. But you know all data that is um, out there for for everyone with 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 equal access. In in those situations, that becomes personal data. So some kind of fiction you create within within the interpretation also of 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 how you meet that sort of threshold um, of what becomes personal data. So even if it is two distinct points, but together you can tie in and identify the individual. Uh, it 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 does become personal data. It's also a technical question on whether it is possible to reverse engineer or not. So sort of identifying both of those threads and 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 yeah would would be important to answer that question. Understood. We also see a couple of uh, questions coming in on publicly available data. Uh, and uh, I mean, that was uh, maybe you want to talk about that restriction a little bit and how we're anticipating this to be uh, uh, anticipating this to be to be playing out. There is one of the complications that has come in on the chat, right? So, uh, I mean, in the in the law itself, the example that the government has given us, I think, is a little bit more straightforward where they say that if, a, uh, you know, that a person has shared views on a social media platform, uh, that would constitute uh, publicly available data. But some of the case studies that we've been uh, you know, dealing with have been a little bit more complex. And the question, say, for example, that has come in is um, uh, there is a publicly available web page, but that web page contains personal data of individuals such as phone numbers. What happens in these cases, right? If I receive such quote unquote public data from these websites, uh, is this now governed by the DPDP? So the uh, the law only exempts data that the individual herself has made available. Uh, which the individual herself has made publicly available. You're right. The example that they've given there is is fairly simplistic. You're blogging. It's you know it's 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 sort of easy, um, easy to put out there. Um, but say if I put my phone number, it's publicly available on a public profile on LinkedIn, and someone has collated that and 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 put that on another website. Is is that sort of provenance then enough to say that even the third party website is actually only this is all personal uh, publicly available data in some way uh, because the individual herself made this made this public, um, but of course there are lots of sort of checks to 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 pass through here. One is it's, if it's a completely public profile, can anyone access that data? Must you create an account there? Is there some entry fee? Um, is it like a private profile, but you've made certain, if it's about views, have you made certain posts public? So lots of questions there in, in, in each of these sort of, you know, instances. Um, but if, if, if a third party entirely has simply, um, you just see a, 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 a blog with numbers of different people. Um, I'm not sure if you can trace, if you can justify that that is actually publicly available, that the individual herself has made it public, or if it is, if it has been made publicly available under some legal obligation. Um, wh what do you think, Neha, actually, on 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 this one? So, so I was I was just trying to, and again, some more some more questions coming in. Um, right. Uh, some of the factors, I suppose, one, I think that this is a determination that we'll have to make on a case by case basis, right? I don't think we can come up with some kind of a bright line test that says um, all data that might be shared on a public, on a, you know, on a platform might be considered to be quote unquote publicly available data. I think obviously, uh, and I'm ignoring here for the moment uh, restrictions that platforms themselves will definitely have in their terms of use mm. um, in terms of how data on a particular platform is to be used or shared. Um, for example, I mean, pretty much every platform, uh, you know, social media, whether it's a professional networking site or even otherwise, does have restrictions on, um, you know, on companies not being able to use crawlers, etc. On businesses, you're not allowed to use crawlers to be able to get that kind of data, etc. But so I suppose what would some of these factors be? Uh, we'll have to look at. Um, uh, I'm I'm wondering how much does individual interest, uh, individual intent matter, right? If I shared it within uh, the walled gardens of a social media platform, even if the audience for that platform was say ten thousand people, uh, does that still mean that 
because in some ways it is gated and limited to users of that particular platform that this is not publicly available information um right and how much how much does user intent matter and how much does the size of the audience matter really those are the two things that i sort of keep coming back to but i do think that this is a determination that we'll have to keep making on a on a on a case by case basis um yeah Fair, yeah, I think there'll be these sort of questions to ask for each piece of data that you're getting from 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 public sources um, with respect to individual sort of data attributes for sure. Yeah, and I also think it's interesting because um, the minister has said that the intent of the law, uh, this is Minister Chandrasekhar has also said that the intent of the law is not to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, organizations are able to circumvent the obligations. I think even for publicly available data, he has said that individual consent must be taken. So I think, again, this is one of those things that we'll expect to see a little bit more clarity from, from the government in terms of how, you know, publicly available data, how they are thinking about publicly available data. Uh, because if it's just something that's supposed to be restricted to views that I'm expressing on platforms, I think that's an easier problem to navigate than some of these other sort of situations that we've been that we've been grappling with. So there is one more question, Shindi. Even if information is made publicly available on social media, a social media user does not consent to the use uh, for different purposes, right? So what happens? Does this con again? I think this goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Um, in terms of perhaps I think intent might be a little bit relevant if I've shared it within a closed group versus if I've shared it in an uh, in an open group or if I've posted something on LinkedIn and my profile is a public profile where you know even somebody who's not on LinkedIn um, can potentially see everything that I have posted on LinkedIn now again like I said assuming for the moment keeping aside LinkedIn's own terms of use um, for the moment I think these would be two different scenarios for the purposes of uh, for the purposes of publicly available data. Would mm -hmm. that be something that you would agree with, Srinidhi? So I'm actually not very sure if intent will be that important because it's it's also not structured as an exception to consent. Uh, oh. It's not linked to a purpose. It's actually just an exemption on, on applicability itself that that data is only, you know, processing or publicly available information is not, uh, that individual has made public is not, not covered. So I'm not sure if... If I put something up on a public profile on social media, then can I say that I did not consent to it being pulled up or, or scraped up? That that I'm not entirely sure if that's the that's sort of the 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 intent there. Um, not sure how much to read into it. Like I wouldn't actually read too much into intent. Understood. Perhaps. Understood. Uh, maybe we shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, territorial applicability, Shrinidhi. Uh, what are the principles that we're seeing where the Indian law is trying to establish this kind of territorial nexus with India? Because without a territorial nexus, obviously, we cannot have um, the law sort of apply. And there are a couple of instances where it is talking about extraterritorial application, extending to businesses which may not necessarily be, you know, physically situated in the country. And how do we see some of the provisions, I suppose, um, you know, on territoriality and even otherwise, if you want to talk about, compare with some of these other laws that we're seeing uh, with GDPR in particular. Sure. Yeah. So uh, the law also applies to offshore businesses. If you're, it actually only applies to offshore businesses if you're offering goods or services in India. That's the framing that the law uses. Um, and offering typically would mean some kind of targeted sort of systematic activity that 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 you're targeting residents in India in, in some way. Um, so an example that that I often take is say if it's just a news website which is available everywhere in the world, anyone can enter their email ID and subscribe to the newsletter. That's that. Like there's no other purpose for that. It's the website is available everywhere across the across the world. Um, versus a situation where maybe it's it's an e-commerce platform there is some level of target it allows you to make purchases in indian rupees it gives you the option to translate some of the content into indian languages there is some curated content for india that shows intent that the platform wants to target indian residents there is some offering happening in a tangible manner um so i think that's the that's the threshold that it is not all incidental access 
um in within within india of an offshore businesses platform that will that will be covered but there has to be some element of systematic activity um for for that to apply um and also i think there's also one important piece here is just uh, what this means for so there are a large number of indian uh, say it it service providers who might be processing data for global customers enterprise customers um payroll processing companies maybe in india you're doing payroll for um companies in the us in 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 the eu you're processing only foreign residents data you're not really bothered really there's no indian element as such there's a specific exemption to that this was intended to sort of encourage the it ites industry also uh, so that you don't have very hard line um rules around around the data because the objective or the the thinking is that the the global law anyway applies to the enterprise and through the enterprise to the indian uh, data processor as well so that's an exception um as well here um, what happens if i'm just using a foreign cloud service provider uh, very many companies based in india but you know uh, data is stored overseas it's stored in uh, you know it's stored in singapore very popular destination of choice of course there's a cross border angle to this um, but uh, is there also a you know territorial application angle to this so um i think of this more as a cross border sort of angle where your um your base i'm assuming in this fact situation you are an indian entity you are an indian you're, entity you're actually yeah. you're targeting indian residents you're collecting yeah. indian residents yeah. data yeah. and you engage an offshore service provider um, they're storing data outside india uh, so while you as the indian entity then have to make sure that the data that they're storing is not in a country which is on the blacklist uh so for cross border data transfers the government now says that you can transfer data to any region except countries that are notified by the government uh which are you know we can restrict transfers to such such countries so it's a blacklist so if the government were to come out with a list uh of 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 countries to which you can't transfer data then then you must tell sort of your offshore uh, data processor also to not transfer uh, not sort of store data in 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 that region or not transfer data to that region um and typically i would this would be part of say your contracts with csps of course you can choose regions as well where you're storing data but it will form it will be part of the contracts that you're that you're um, signing with them understood understood so um so is there something in the bill again because where we are talking about um you know data being stored overseas and a large number of indian startups definitely uh, do do this does the bill make certain concessions or allowances for startups whether it's on data storage or even or even otherwise or even just again taking a step back how do we what do we see the impact on startup is um from a, again from a compliance point of view uh you know should i as a startup be thinking about these things a little bit differently from a larger company does it make a difference yeah so there is some recognition that 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 um, so there's an there's there's an exception that's that's provided in the law that the government can notify any data fiduciary or any class of data fiduciaries including startups from certain provisions of the law um and and the way startup is defined is it's it's whichever sort of sort so if if you have a dpit certificate you're designated as a startup by the dpit uh, the government under this law could also notify come out with another notification saying that any startup with this I, I mean some kind of a criteria some kind of a threshold and exempt them from certain provisions of the law uh, so there is that acknowledgement that the the bill should not or the law should not be overly say onerous uh, to startups there should be a reasonable kind of compliance window as well um, for for startups so there is that allowance it's not an automatic exception though the government will have to notify that this class of entities or this this these type of startups can't um, you know are are exempt from certain provisions of the law so um, we have to wait for the government to tell us who a startup will be for the purposes of um, the purposes of, of this law yeah while dpit may have its definition other ministries may have their definition but but my reading of this is that the government will have to come out with some notification saying okay this startup not exempt from certain provisions of the law okay so once we have that clarity from the government uh, in terms of who or what a startup is there are certain allowances uh, that the bill gives us any other uh, sort of big picture impact from the from the startup perspective yeah for a lot of i think homegrown startups it is um 
it for, for for global businesses often some of them are already aware of 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 say global regulations around gdpr um depending on the scale size of startup if it's a completely sort of homegrown only india focused startup it 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 will be sort of a shift in how they're consuming data how they're viewing data um um overall um so i do think that there is a uh, uh, the 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 sort of the compliance hit is a little you you do have to think this through a little more um there's there's you are sort of starting at at, at a certain um you're starting afresh in some ways and perhaps that's why the law also acknowledges that that there may be certain allowances that are that are granted to startups i think the um the minister of state had also indicated that there could be some kind of phased implementation graded implementation also some different sort of compliance windows as well for different kinds of entities um acknowledging that this might be this might be um like a new new piece uh, for for smaller businesses to comply with um, but at the same time i wouldn't i think size and scale the number of users they have there's also this concept of a significant data fiduciary with heightened obligations so if you have a large user base or if you're processing a large volume of sensitive data then you get categorized as an sdf and you have certain other obligations there those are potentially unless you are you know if it's a very very uh, like by very sensitive data you're processing potentially that could be based on user threshold and and there is some leeway in complying with those kind of heightened obligations um but 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 yeah, again that's also something that will come through in the in through notifications as to what is an sdf understood so uh, a related question i mean on the startups point um and i think the, the i mean the short answer to anil's question i think is yes right he's saying as startups have specifically been called out is it possible that the intention is to cover other similar entities like msmes honestly i think the answer to that is we'll have to wait and see what the government sort of defines as a startup right it might hark back to the dpiit definition for the purposes of tax exemptions or it might be in they might decide something on the basis of turnover they might decide something on the basis of um, you know i don't know the number of users that you have average monthly daily or monthly users um uh, i don't think there is clarity i don't think that the law also indicates to us in a particular points us um in any particular direction but it is possible that there might be some exemptions for maybe smaller companies right that's how we're that's how we're reading it yeah, um so. so far yeah a uh, couple of more questions that, that have come up and i just want to put a pin in this cross border data flows conversation because i see a lot of activity uh, i see a lot of activity in the chat as well but uh, do you think um, basically if this is the summation of that right there is no hard data localization requirement in the new law um we have moved now to an approach where the government is going to give us a list of countries to which data cannot be transferred subject to whatever sector specific guidelines uh, and laws that we have this therefore means that we can transfer data overseas except to blacklisted countries and subject to sector specific legislations can this list keep changing of blacklisted countries theoretically yes uh, but if you read the sort of geopolitical trade winds and just generally sort of keeping in mind india's um economic and national security priorities uh i think very many uh economies with whom india might have business on a more and might not otherwise have geopolitical tensions uh do we anticipate that they'll end up on that blacklist shrinidhi i think the blacklist will be a narrow list of countries um and that's the intention you i think you you've summarized it correctly i think there's nothing really more to add there but 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 yeah it it, it is likely to be a um short list of course the we've also seen this perspective change within the government over since we started talking about this uh, since the first version which which called for localization now there isn't sort of a local storage requirement as such but but if there are countries which uh, while the factors are not specified in the law from conversations from interviews there are a bunch of different themes like national security uh, reciprocity trade relations i think all of those do go into determining what that list of countries that you can't transfer data to would 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 look like and this is very different from say what we see in the gdpr yeah. do you think yeah. do you like this more i mean it's cleaner it's simpler it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a simple list as opposed to having organizations you know take on the burden of uh, you know 
say SECs, but uh, we've also heard uh, you know, some people criticize this and saying that it's there is a little bit more flexibility in the GDPR because there are more bases and grounds on the basis of which you can transfer. Uh, so there are some differences with the GDPR, but do you like this? Do you like this more? Uh, it is cleaner, um, but yeah, I think GDPR is structured very differently. There the thinking is transfer data only to these, in under these different circumstances, one is adequacy some 15 countries are notified so far in all of these years then secs which are relied on fairly um rampant <laughs> in a rampant sort of fashion um so so the sort of the thinking is entirely um different um yeah yeah this is a much sort of cleaner it, it simply says do what you will whether you're transferring here whether you're transferring elsewhere it's more a question of well fiduciary it is your neck on the line we don't care where you transfer data to except of course that negative blacklist but um, but it's we are going to come after you and that's the sort of theme more accountability than we will decide what countries you can and can't transfer data to fiduciary, of course can't fiduciary your neck is on the line is a general theme that cuts across the entire uh, legislation though right we don't really see obligations coming in for data processor. So how do you think that this relationship between a fiduciary and a processor is likely? I know we're going to cover this in some detail in our next session. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but, uh, you know, this is perhaps my penultimate question um, to you, right? How do we how do we think that this relationship is going to play out in practice? Is then everything now left up to contract? Yeah, everything is left up to con contract. There are two, three clauses which are telling fiduciary specifically this is what you must do with respect to processors one is just that you have to enter into a valid contract that's one the second is it's saying that when you're erasing somebody's withdrawn their consent erasing their data you must also make sure that your data processor is erasing that data now if that means can you just get away with only having this in the contract or are there additional checks that you will have to implement do you get like a written notification from the processors then once um confirming that they've deleted this data that's that's another piece and the third one is where it says that the fiduciary must also make sure that the processor is implementing reasonable security safeguards so some kind of a vetting of what process what security measures they'll be they'll be implementing um a lot more of course is 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 you know if if it really depends on what the nature would be if 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 the if the processor is acting as an agent for the fiduciary and actually going to go to the users and collect data on the fiduciary's behalf then there'll be more checks and balances in the contract strict purpose limitation use limitation all of that is not specified in the law as something that the fiduciary must ask the processor but that's the implication because completely like it's the fiduciary sort of neck neck on the line in, entirely so it's uh the thinking there is you figure it out and and i think it's also that the individual should not have to trace and figure out who the processor might be for the individual the storefront is your fiduciary we we simply will go to the fiduciary and the fiduciary will figure out whom to claim this this from sure sure individual and perhaps even the government yeah yeah correct 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 yeah. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's fair. All right. But there are certain so you know in 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 the during investigations during um certain special circumstances the law uses fairly wide framing for for those that it doesn't necessarily limit to fiduciaries. So how I read it as how uh, a lot of the regulatory authorities also right now. Well, this is a point of departure from RBI where the RBI directions in their outsourcing agreement. RBI says here are the 10 things that you must include in your outsourcing agreement. One of those is also say audit rights. Um, now this law doesn't necessarily say that, but I would suspect that a lot of, you know, those similar sort of provisions will find their way in the contract as well. Uh, and the government and or the D data protection board can also ask uh, processors then in some way that look, you're processing on behalf of this entity. So provide us with certain information. It's also provided in your contract. So that sort of that, that, that chain might still continue. Got it. Got it. Okay. A uh, couple of more, and I'm also mindful of time. We're at 4.25. Uh, I wanted to do a little bit of crystal ball ge uh, gazing, Shindi, and I think there's a related question that has come up as well. Uh, given that so much has been left up to the rules, I do think that there's an opportunity um, for us to all collectively engage with the government as well. I don't think that the government is averse to hearing from the industry in terms of what, uh, you know, uh, what the rules should look like. 
um, and what kind of best practices perhaps should make their way into into the rules. Um, there is one related question that has come in, uh, just in terms of how the language has been phrased, right? Um, the act uses the language, quote unquote, as may be prescribed as multiple instances. Does that mean that the government may or may not release specific rules? Um, in this context, how should organizations proceed, especially when the act says that the government may specify the manner in which a notice should be given? Uh, my two bits here, again, going back to something that you were talking about earlier, Shrinidhi, is um, that, uh, I mean, I'm not reading that as may be prescribed to mean that the government may or may not come up with rules. I do think that it's a matter of time before we will see some kind of rules, guidance, um, in whatever form coming in from the government on different aspects of implementation. But at the same time, I do not think that we should wait for that guidance. I think that um, the spirit of the law and really what the requirement is has been reasonably clearly encapsulated um, in the phrasing of the sections. And I think that uh, you know, given that we've spent the past six years in really having these conversations, we've also seen a lot more uh, developments in global data protection norms. And I think that those could also be useful sort of um, places to look at to get some kind of guidance, right? So, I mean, I think it's okay. I, I, as long as we're able to come up with a notice that's say simple and clear and easy to understand, I don't necessarily think that this is something that we should, you know, wait for a prescribed format coming in from the government but tell me tell me tell me if you feel otherwise or if you disagree yeah no that's fair i think that implementation may not entirely turn on the rules um it it, it would not be a complete um it, it won't go below what at least the law is specifying so let's let's take the example of a notice it says you have to show three things one is uh, the manner in which uh, purpose of, you know, what's the data you're collecting, purpose of data collection. Second is manner in which you can exercise, individuals can exercise their rights. Third is how you can make complaints to the data protection board. Um, now, the form, they may specify that, you know, you can have like an email notification or a pop-up in the app or I, I mean, I would suspect that there are multiple different methods or some principles only that they'll provide for in the law also. Um, because it, it it is actually simply not possible to hard code all of this in any kind of prescriptive uh, format because something might not work at all for for a particular business. Um, so it, it it and also I think this is a great opportunity I guess to 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 also take some of these best practices to show the government that this is sort of the industry norm. Um, like we've gotten a couple of questions on, um, does this mean that like how with, with software, we have those EULA license, uh, the long form agreement, but you scroll through it and you go to the bottom and then you click on, I agree. Is that going to work? Um, I'm not sure if that is the most ideal practice either, uh, or is it going to be that you have 10 check boxes because consent requirement is saying that it has to be specific. Um, again, I'm not sure that that works neither for neither does it work for the individual nor for the platform really. So some kind of a balance where you are able to show that this is also a privacy protective way of of uh, a privacy conscious way of 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 doing the same job, which is you know providing a service, providing the platform to the um, user. So what that might look on 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 the UI, and we have a session earmark for just that as well, where we hope to show maybe some examples, best practices that we've seen um, from from around the world. Um, but but yeah, I think this is an opportunity on on some of these aspects really. Um, coming up with some some guidance, some model yourself that the industry can go with uh, and, and take to the government rather than, than it being overly prescriptive top down. So we like we should actively think about engaging with the government and, uh, you know, it's it's better for all of us if industry standards are adopted as opposed to a heavy handed prescription coming in from the government. Uh, we are at time, Srinidhi, but uh, I mean, just closing thoughts, right? uh to to sort of bring all of this together and put like a nice little bow on it what would you say would be your top three key recommendations as organizations are thinking about starting this new compliance journey under the dptpa yeah um 
talk to people talk to the people in your across different teams have some sessions have sort of in, get the right people on board uh, all of the things that we talked about in the initial you know beginning of the session i think that's really the first step um, getting the right folks on board second being mapping your data getting you know a complete picture of 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 what all are your um um touch points with 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 data with with individuals and identifying which are the high risk activities um what is something that might raise red flags kind of focusing your implement starting your maybe implementation journey on what how you should solve for those on on those high risk use cases um and then of course everything else will 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 fall in place it will be some sort of a phased journey that you that you uh, begin can I add a number four here, which is actually the theme for our next session, which is identify whether you're a data processor or a data controller because, uh, or a data fiduciary because the uh, bulk of the compliance obligations really fall on the data fiduciary and not really the data processor. Uh, but again, this is not an absolute classification. Um, it is dependent on the processing activity in question, and this is something that we will deep dive into in our in our next session as well, right? Uh, and this was one of the organization. It, this was one of the questions that had come up on chat. It's uh, uh, on the chat today as well. Can the same organization also be a data fiduciary and also be a data processor? Um, the short answer to that is yes. Uh, but given the host of obligations that do come with being a data fiduciary, and the ultimate responsibility to individuals and to the government. Being being with the data fiduciary, I think that that's a very, very, very critical um, sort of determination that businesses uh, businesses have to make. And also the theme for our next discussion. And with that, we are at 4.32. And I think we will call it here and hope to see everybody uh, in a few days for the next discussion on data fiduciaries and processors uh, please please feel free to send in whatever questions that we uh, that you have you can message us uh, on linkedin you can uh, you know you some of you have already sent us questions on the registration form but feel free to write to us um, and we'll do our very best to take up all of them we did the sifting exercise uh, while we were preparing for this uh, for this for this session as well i hope we've been able to address as many questions as possible and we hope to continue doing that in the in the future uh, sessions to come uh, mayank there are a couple of housekeeping questions um, in terms of whether the joining link will be the same etc uh, if you are able to also throw some light on that that we'll, would be great yeah we'll we'll share a separate link to join the meeting all right thank you everyone